Green Halifax, West Yorkshire, southwest of Leeds. This city was founded in the 11th century and was the site of a few battles in the English Civil War of the 1640s. In 1091, the town's name that was recorded meant an area of coarse grass in the nook of land. Halifax is situated in an area called Calderdale. And the main industry here from the 15th century through the 17th century was the production of a woolen fabric called kersey, which is mostly used for military uniforms. In 1475, this area was the lead producer of kersey fabrics in England. And this area had many battles in the English Civil War between the parliamentarians and the royalists. Halifax is infamous for its 13th century invention called the gibbet. The gibbet is actually an early form of what the French called the guillotine. The Lord of Wakefield Manor had the authority to decapitate anyone with stolen goods that valued at 13 and a half pence, which would nowadays be eight pounds or about $10.50 American. The gibbet may have been used as early as 1286, and the execution with it was still continued in 1650, after which Oliver Cromwell outlawed its use. At least 52 people were executed by the use of the gibbet here in Halifax. So it's a block of wood hoisted up with ropes, but at the bottom of the block of wood is an ax head. Down here, the person to be executed would lay their head. Then there would be a basket to collect the decapitated head. All for a theft of about ten and a half dollars. In all, 52 people were executed by this device here in Halifax. Among them were women. In 1627 alone, two women were executed. And this device is about 500 yards away from the boundary for its jurisdiction, for the jurisdiction of the Lord of the Wakefield Manor. So this device is 500 yards away. And they had a rule that if you could escape this device, get your head out of there before the blade comes down. And then you could get, run away, get 500 yards distance from here, probably from about here to that, the other side of that apartment building, tall apartment building. If you can get that distance, then you escape the ax. You will not be executed. They cannot because you're out of jurisdiction. They will not pursue you. But if you ever come back, and they catch you, you will be arrested and executed. That actually happened for one man who escaped in 1617, ran away and he was fine. Seven years later, he tested his luck, came back, he was recognized, arrested again and executed. This time he did not escape. Now we're outside the Minster Church of St. John the Baptist, just down the street from the gibbet this is the oldest building in Halifax within the city. And it's got a history of about 900 years. We believe that the original church was built somewhere probably in the 1100s. And that then it was rebuilt around the early 1300s, late 1200s. but it is a beautiful, beautiful church. But the Minster, it was called, the church was called the Church of St. John the Baptist. But in the year 2000, it was elevated to what's called a Minster Church. Minster meaning that it's a missionary church. We'll take a look inside now. We're in the Minster now. I'm with David Glover, a local historian 
and he's going to fill us in on the history of Halifax and the history of the Minster. Good afternoon, everybody who happens to be listening to me many days, weeks, years hereafter. I'll just tell you a little bit about Halifax Minster, because I could stand here all day and talk about it, and I'd bore you silly. So we're standing in a building which was completed around about the 1430s, which is something like 800 years ago, quite a while. This is a very old building, and I, I'll do my recalculations in a moment and say 600 years rather than 800 years. That would be more accurate. So the font is here, and we believe that this font dates from the 1430s when this church was built. If you look upwards, you'll see it has a very ornate cover, an ornate carved cover up here, which in many, many, many centuries ago would have been coloured and gilded. And they used to keep the font locked with a cover coming down like that, a little chain, and they would lock it so that the holy water for baptism was not stolen. That tradition, of course, went out centuries ago, but that was the original reason for font covers. So for centuries, people would have been received into the Christian church at this point in Halifax, thousands upon thousands of them. The first church on this site, however, wasn't the church of the 1430s. It was a church from much earlier. In fact, dating from around about the year 1120. So if you follow my hand, I'm pointing at a piece of stone which is carved with chevron or zigzag. And that's built into the wall and it's much earlier than what we have around us. It's a piece from the Norman church of around about 1120, reused and built into a much later fabric. That was the first church on the site which this represents. But there was a second church. This is in effect the third church we're in today, a large church. And that large church, I shall make reference to again in a moment. We're going to move along in that direction a short distance and look at a wall which remains from the second church on the side. So this wall on my right here, from left of the door to past the second window up there, is reckoned to be part of a second church on this site, again a smallish church dating probably from the 1270s. That's quite... So behind me is the inside of the Halifax Minster Tower. That dates back to about 1480. It's a little later than the body of the church itself. And above where we see the ceiling, which is currently has a cascade of mementos commemorating those who were lost in the COVID outbreak and those who were ill during that time. Up in that tower there, are the bells, of course. In the lower section above what we see as the ceiling is the rigging room where all the bell ropes are. Above that is a clock room. And right at the very top are the bells themselves. It's a very, very substantial tower. One of the most substantial in the west of Yorkshire. So here we have Victorian pews. And if we turn over in this direction, we see the very fine organ. Mm -hmm. Although this organ is not the one that was installed in 1766, it's the descendant of that organ. It incorporates some of the pipes from an organ which was put in all those years ago in the reign of George III. But it's been twice rebuilt. It was rebuilt first of all in 1879, and then again in 1928-29, which is basically the organ we see today. Some of the casing, very ornate and beautiful casing, and piping above is from a slightly earlier era. It's one of the most powerful organs in Yorkshire, and perhaps in the northern north of England. It's not the biggest organ, but it has some of the best noises, some of the best pipes and such like but needs constant tender loving care. It really is in need of a rebuild, which will cost a lot of money when that comes along. We'll now go from the organ up 
to the sanctuary area. So from the earliest times in this church, that is the building we see today, going back anyway to the 1430s, there would have been an altar behind me. Not perhaps in such an elevated position as that we see today. This whole area was revamped and rebuilt really in the 1870s. So that is what we see today. And the altar table is from that era. If we look to one side though, we see something which is much older and that is in this direction. We have what is called a set of sedilia, three seats for priests and those who would have been serving at the altar in medieval times, probably from the 1430s. And there are three designs. There's one on the left, which is an angel, one in the middle, which is a creature, and one on the right, which is a mermaid with a comb. And these are medieval. They date probably from the 1430s, as I think I may have said. Probably made for this church. There are other carvings. Here we have one. Smaller carvings below and beyond. And we're talking about some strange creatures up on the outside of the hole. far end and the, the very furthest one is a dragon then we have a sheep then we have another dragon and then we have a very interesting character a man playing bagpipes but that was a tradition that we believe that this rather strange looking chap represents the man who played the bagpipes on the platform of the gibbet when there was when there was somebody having their head cut off. Thank you for watching. If you like what you saw, please give me a thumbs up. Please subscribe so you can be alerted to future episodes of Travel with Sean.